Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director at GNET TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Thursday, July 6th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined in the studio today by Dr. Randy Lowe, who is the school superintendent of the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. Randy, thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me today, Andrew. So our topic is uh, this proposal that's uh, emerged uh, for a new middle school that uh, might be uh, part of the picture in the Taconic and Green Regional District. And I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that the Taconic and Green Regional District is one of three school districts in the Bayer issue, the other two being uh, the Medway District that includes Rupert and Paulet and uh, the Winnall School District. But this proposal for the middle school would involve the Taconic and Green District, uh, nine towns altogether mm -hmm. uh, involved in that. Um, I wonder if you could bring us up to speed on where this proposal stands at the moment. Uh, your Taconic and Green board met uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a long discussion and watched a presentation about it. Uh, and came up with a recommendation uh, on how to go forward. So I wonder if you could walk us through where that stands at the moment and then we can dig into the proposal and why it seems like it might be a good idea. Sure, so we've had a, a different groups of people um, engaged in this discussion around a region middle school for about the last 14 months. So an original group made a, a first series of recommendations to the Taconic and Green Board in October part of the work that we've done since then is is exactly what they agreed to at that time and so at the June Taconic and Green meeting I made the next set of recommendations so through all the work we've done um, there continues to be evidence that we should be looking at a regional middle school so that's what I proposed to the board I recommended that they um, that they take a deeper look at uh, the Manchester, the Manchester Elementary Middle School s site, the, the school grounds and the building itself, the possibility of renovating it, expanding it, or possibly new construction on the property, as well as looking at whether there's any additional land or in Manchester that we could potentially build if appropriate. And for the board to also begin some community engagement work where they can um, meet with members of the community, talk about the why we're why we're looking at this, why this is important, educationally relevant, and important for our students, and answer questions that people might have as we continue to move forward with um, exploring this idea. So there'll be uh, more meetings to come, I yes. guess, before the idea is fully fleshed out. Absolutely. Um, so I guess the first question then that comes to mind is uh, what prompted this uh, initiative? Uh, right now you have middle schools in Manchester, Dorset, and up at Floodbrook mm -hmm. uh, for the Mountain Town uh, uh, area. Um, why not leave that as is? Uh, what would be the advantages to having one regional middle school where I take it all the sixth through eighth graders uh, would attend there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you are right. We're looking at sixth through eighth grade for a middle school. And um, part of, there's a whole lot of reasons as to why. There's been discussions within communities around a, a regional middle school for many, many years, and it never really got traction. When the merger study committee originally was forming Taconic and Green, part of their discussions were around the opportunity that we could create a middle school with this merger. So that was discussed at that time. Board members were, you know, some board members were really interested in looking at this. Um, I'm now finishing my third year as superintendent and I have observed, made a lot of observations in, in my three years. We have declining enrollment and so that is leading to reduction in middle school staff. Middle school teachers need certifications that elementary teachers don't. So we are, we are constantly needing to add provisional licenses, get people trained in additional content areas. Some are teaching multiple contents like math and science um, and multiple grade levels. And it's a lot. It's a constant moving, um, like moving foundation for teaching. And so teachers aren't necessarily able to become experts in their content. And um, and it's affecting, you know, 
how we how we educate our kids. So we're seeing that fluidity across all three middle schools. Because of declining enrollment uh, in our K, uh, their K-8 buildings right now, so MEMS and Floodbrook and Dorset are all K-8 or pre-K-8 buildings, um, we're really seeing the impact of middle schoolers not having their developmentally appropriate space. Um, I just at the end of the school year had, had a conversation with an employee who had just been with us for this year. And she said, you know, I was supportive of this middle school, but I just want to say after being in this K-8 building, I understand a whole lot more why this is so important. And that was a good testimony for me. Like when you're there and you see um, how, what the needs are of middle schoolers, you realize having a space that's completely aligned with who they are as as youth in their development, it you just you, you see it, and it's tr tough to get that in a K-8 building. I think the la there's there's more details I could give you, but the last really important one for me is that we have because the schools are small. Um, well. D middle schoolers are developing their sense of identity, right? They're separating from their parents, they're finding out who they are, they're developing in a way that we all know what happens in middle school, right? It's a complicated time. And because our s populations are small, what we are finding is that there are some students who feel very alone and very separate because they, they can't sort of find their, their tribe, their people to connect with. and. Um, because you know, I use the words like it's we don't have a very large pond for our fish, right? So, so they can't kind of find their people. In a larger middle school, the likelihood that people would, our students would find people with common interests and common perspectives and just common commonalities for identity is is much greater, and that's important for our kids. We have uh, every year many kids who are kind of on the fridge and, and, and feel isolated and alone, and, and I want to do what we can to reduce that. So uh, do you think that the, the best way to go would be to uh, construct an entirely new building for this regional school, or would uh, a reconfiguration of the existing MEMS building be a better way to go? I have no idea. Um, I, this is totally not my wheelhouse. I am not a visionary. I can't look at a building and see the possibilities the way that an architect can. Um, I know that when we went through this visioning work with New Vista Design um, over the you know winter and spring months, um, you know they part of that process was showing, hey, you can take a you know whatever double loaded corridor. I think that's the right word, and and you can knock down these windows and you can create these spaces or you can knock down these walls and do this. It looks good. I have a hard time envisioning that. So this is the point where we really start taking the lead with the experts, the people who say, yes, this is possible and this is not possible. Or the cost, if you really want to be able to create a, a space that is accessible in every way you want for your middle schoolers, you can or you can't do it here. Like I. I would will defer to them and listen to their recommendations and you know bring that back to the board. So uh, would have you gotten any feedback from like the other towns outside of Manchester uh, that say, hey, wait a minute, we we'd like to keep our sixth through eighth grade kids local? So Has that been an issue that's bubbled up in the conversations? I'm not hearing a lot of that. The, the concerns tend to come from the parents of our elementary age students who, uh, who really like their elementary students being in their local school. And so there, there's concern around, well, what does this potentially mean for me? And we don't have an answer to that. You know, it's, uh, we're focusing on the middle school. They're definitely, you know, we'll have to look at the entire system. But um, the middle, what we found is that the voices and input from middle school parents or parents who, who have high school students now are that, yes, we're looking for something that is more than what our students are currently getting. So the people who've gone through it recognize that there are benefits to having a more consolidated middle school. 
So what would the rough timeline be for, ideally, in a perfect world, which I'm sure <laughs> we're not living in, but uh, if, uh, if you could sort of uh, you know, wave the magic wand and say, gee, it would be great to have this facility in place by when? I, I suppose by se the September might be a great time. <laughs> but uh, since that's not going to happen, are we thinking two years, three years, five years? Uh, so the, the, there'll be steps along the way, but the big moment will be when we have a bond vote that goes to the voters. So in the most ideal world, that would go in the March 2024 uh, school district election. That's probably a little bit optimistic, um, but because next year is an election year, there'll also be the August primary election, and then there'll be the November election. So we potentially could go to any of those times, and my hope would be that we can hit one of those with a, with a bond vote if we're moving forward, and we have time to do everything we need to do before that. I don't know if it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I realize it's probably premature, but uh, is there any sense as well with the rough numbers that we're looking at? That's I have absolutely no idea. Yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's going to depend on what what we end up proposing. Um, I I should have mentioned also uh, near the start that uh, people who are interested in this can go to the BRSU's website. Yes. BRSU.org. And and read a lot of information about uh, some of the conversations you've already had and presentations that have been made and uh, some great background material is, is available there to get everyone up to speed on, on where things stand. Um, I guess I, I was struck by, uh, as I went through it uh, earlier this week to, uh, to prepare for this, uh, how, how frequently the, the term equity mm -hmm. was mentioned by the groups of parents and teachers and staff uh, around this process. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Why, why is that issue so important mm -hmm. to so many groups? So, you know, it, w when you look at those lists, you've got, I think it's equity and inclusion, and then later on you have diversity and cultures. I believe that that's the language in there. So equity inclusion um, in this context represents not not necessarily sort of uh, equity of historically marginalized groups, although that is a part of this. It, it really is about equity of opportunity and experiences. So right now, um, you know, Manchester might have a math counts team and they're participating in their regional math counts competition and qualify for the state math counts and they're, they're meddling and right, w winning that. But the students at Floodbrook and Dorset don't have the opportunity to participate in that. Or um, a musical experience, you know, uh, uh, maybe Floodbrook is doing, perf doing a middle school musical and the students at Dorset and Manchester aren't having that opportunity right now. So, so the, the very discrepant opportunities that exist right now are part of what is challenging for families and for students because they realize that it's not the same across the schools and and the students and families want those opportunities. We want everyone to be included. We want a model in which we have a wide breadth of educational programming so that every child has uh, programming that is designed for them, that works for them. And when you have a really small class size like you know, Dorset has, you know, 20, 22 eighth graders uh, or, you know, and seventh graders. They, they don't have very many students. So if students are more hands-on learners or um, require um, a certain type of programming, they can't provide it right now. And I want, I want to make sure that all of our, all of our students um, have the opportunity to be successful with our programming in a way that we're just not currently able to offer because of, you know, how spread out resources are. Um, you said earlier that the architectural side of this may not be your, your wheelhouse, but I, I guess I just wondered, uh, in, in, in some of the presentations that are on the, on the website there uh, that are talking about this, uh, it seems like there's an interest in um, having more flexible spaces yeah. uh, for middle, middle school age students uh, and, and larger spaces in, in contrast to sort of the uh, classrooms that are probably a lot of the viewers are familiar with that were built 
80 or 100 years ago, a uh, very traditional kind of uh, classroom space. This th looks like uh, the idea here, the more modern interpretation is to have more open space and rooms that can be converted for multiple different uses. Is, mm -hmm. Would that be a fair way to put it? So uh, I would say that that is part of it. I'll expand on that a little bit. What we know about best practices for education right now are that um, all students are included, that teachers are working with, classroom teachers are working with interventionists or with special education teachers to, um, you know, to, to teach groups of students and to pull small groups off to do additional instruction or, um, you know, more specialized instruction. And so when you look at a, a 21st century school right now, they're designed for that because, you know, federal laws are saying this is what we should be doing this is what's best for teaching and learning. And the outcomes are showing that. So, so the models and designs that we were shown um, you know, put forth that idea. And you're absolutely right. It, it's not, again, a double-loaded corridor where you've got you know, the exact same classrooms along both sides. And you know, a, a reading intervention classroom is way at the end of the hall, and a special ed room is down here, and kids go to those spaces. Instead, you have you know pods of learning where you've got clusters of classrooms and you've got the support staff and the spaces for kids to all be educated within that same learning space. Um, it, it, there are benefits, there's just countless benefits to that type of a model. And right now we don't ha have that in any of our <laughs> schools really. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if the, the new middle school just, just for hypothetical talking purposes right here winds up being uh, at, at MEMS. Um, that would seem to be leaving a lot more additional classrooms at Dorset and Floodbrook kind of available for what? More different kinds of classes or that's how would that all space to be, be used? Yeah, that's all to be looked at. So Floodbrook has some modulars so folks would move into the building, which would be that's I think a benefit to that particular building, being able to have everyone in the building if we had some extra classroom space. Um, at Dorset you're talking about, you know, three classrooms. It's not a tremendous amount of space there, but we haven't gotten to that point of then what? What might it look like? Um, all of that will be part of what happens, I would say, over the next six months, some bigger discussions. You mentioned earlier that uh, enrollment is declining. Is that the case across all nine towns that uh, are part of the TNG, or, or is that uh, just a certain couple of the communities? That's a good question. So because we have inter-district choice right now, I can't give you an accurate answer to that because we have students from t any towns, all, all towns attending different schools. So um, for instance, we're seeing a, a pretty notable decline in the Dorset school-aged population, but the Dorset school enrollment is up because of inter-district choice. So when students, you know, are moving between schools, it's helping to level out our, our enrollment. Um, and some of the classes that you would have been very small are now a, a more typical or expected n enrollment for that class or that grade level. It also, you know, might move a classroom at, that might have been up at you know, an elementary classroom there might have been 18, 19, or 20 at Manchester might bring it down to, you know, 15 or 16 or 17. So it provides a little bit of flexibility. So I can't give you an exact answer to the question around towns. Um, and, uh, and even school enrollment is tricky to tell because of the impact of interdistrict choice. So right now, uh a student in, in, from Manchester could go to middle school in Dorset or yes. Floodbrook if they wanted and vice versa? Yes. Okay. Um, it's interesting that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the school age population is declining because it, it, it seemed like, uh, you know, one, one of the, the, the things we seem to be seeing in the early stages of the, the pandemic era was that there were more people moving to the area and presumably eventually that would translate into more students in school. But that's not happening so far. 
We had a demographic study that's also on the BRSU.org site, and the trend is not looking for uh, it to be for our enrollment to be increasing. Hmm. So, uh, the other thing I was interested in uh, the point you mentioned earlier the uh, different qualifications for medical, medical, middle school students, uh, middle school teachers compared to middle uh, elementary uh, teachers. They have to have more, what, licenses, or, or they have to pass more qualifications? Is that, is that the So, case? Um, for an elementary license, it's for grades K to 6, and it includes all content areas. So you get an elementary license, and you can teach reading, and writing, and math, and science, and social studies, and everything that a student would learn, because oftentimes those classrooms are self-contained, right? You're in second grade, and this is my second grade teacher, and I do everything in this classroom. When you look at licenses, Beyond sixth grade, there's you seven through twelve is one license type, or there's also middle middle grades like a six through eight, but they're content specific. So the license you would get would be for English, or for math, or for science. So you and that's just because of the way our educational system has been historically. So it's not more; it's just a different you're more limited in grades 7 through 12 about what you can teach. So if we hired a teacher for a social studies position and we and and then there was decline and they taught social studies and there was declining enrollment and we said, "Hey, if we need you to teach English too because I don't really need two teachers. Now that person has to get a license in English as well." Hmm. Interesting. Um now you, you again on, on the website, uh, the BRC website, you have a lot of information there. I guess is there anything in particular that stands out to you from those team's reports that uh, were, were submitted that you really struck you as being, wow, this is really critical that we need to act on and really justifies this, you know, reconfiguration of how we're doing things? I, I would say that one of the things that was most striking to me was the um, the value that the community, every group that met, put on outdoor education. I've known that anecdotally. We know that people like doing things outside. We're, you know, in general, a community that really values the outdoors. To hear that across every group surfacing as a top priority, access to like high quality outdoor education opportunities. Um, whether you know sustainability experiences outside, um, I was struck. I think at how much, how many times that surfaced as a priority, and that's really helpful and important information for me to have. And the students can't do that now in the various towns. I mean, I would have thought all three of the schools are sort of in areas that could access the outdoors. And... Yeah, nope, they do. Um, but I think that when you have um, Again, a, a larger population of students that um, that is focusing on, you know, it, it, the, if the middle school science, you've got a, you've got more resources, you've got more students, um, you you have the ability to, um, I think, provide more robust opportunities. I wouldn't say that the priority doesn't mean it doesn't exist now. I think the priority means they continue to value it and want to make sure it's included. Um, I recall it back in the mid-2000s, I can't remember the exact year, I want to say 2005 to 2007, somewhere in there, uh, there was a, a, a conversation around whether or not Manchester and Dorset could sort of, one would be the middle school, one would be the elementary school uh, for both communities, but that, that never got off the ground. Um, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, back then, each community was saying, well, we really want to have our elementary kids kind of stay in close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think uh, much has shifted since then uh, that would allow, at least for the middle school age students, to, you know, be bused, I'm assuming, out, outside of their home communities to a different place? and. Uh, some of the concerns that might have been present 15 or so years ago have been alleviated in some way? I 
think that families still really value their elementary age children attending a local community school. That is inherent in Vermont. Vermonters really, really like the school down the street in their community. Um, I don't think that that has changed. And that's, you know, potentially down the road going to be important in, uh, conversations for us to be having as we look at the big picture of the middle school. Um, you know, there is, I think, a, a general shift when it comes to middle school and families are more willing to, um, you know, have their students travel for a middle school experience. Um, and I, you know, I'm pr pretty open about the fact that I really want the best, best middle school experience in the area. I want to build that for our kids. I want to be attracting people to our program. I want um, a strong academic, social, extracurricular uh, program in which every child has a place to flourish and prosper and be successful. And then they have an easy and smooth transition to high school. So um, that's, that's my goal. Um, I really think that we have an opportunity um, to discuss this and provide a more solid program than we have right now. So uh, just to wind up, uh, what, what then are going to be the next steps? Are, are the, I'm sure the TNG board is going to continue to discuss this uh, at, at their meetings. Will there be uh, some sort of a community meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, in all three uh, school districts to uh, talk about it and have uh, people from the communities come in and you know have their say or tell tell you what they think about it. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll be working with an architect. You know that's gonna that work kind of figuring that out will will be a next step. To Connick and Green at their next meeting, uh, well they've got a, a special meeting next week, but and it won't be discussed then. But at their August meeting, they will um, I think put together a committee. And that committee will uh, begin to talk through some of those um, questions that you just asked. So yes, for sure, for community engagement events, what that looks like, where they'll be, when they'll be, I don't know the answer to. But but I do know that the Taconic and Green Board is very, very interested in uh, hearing from the community, sharing information, and so there, you know, and that was part of what they agreed to do. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, it's an exciting time, and um, you know, we'll be continuing to communicate with folks on our website and to families um, about meetings and how this all begins to shape up. So. Well, all right. Uh, certainly a very exciting proposal, very interesting idea, and the one we'll certainly be following along with. Uh, but uh, Dr. Lowe, thank you very much for uh, coming in today and, and uh, uh, bringing us up to speed on what's going on. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sure going to keep you all very busy <laughs> there <laughs> and open yeah, next you're door. Welcome. Thanks uh, for having me. Thank, thank you for making the time for it. And thanks to all of you for being with us today as well. I hope you found our program interesting, and, uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.